uh, thanks as well to uh, arts and sciences development who uh, got us to this point. Um, so I'm David Steigerwald. I teach modern US history here at Ohio State and I'm the director of our World War II study abroad program. I'm joined today by my erstwhile colleague and um, um, football friend, uh, Professor Peter Mansour, and um, Kevin Roberts, who was a student in the 2017 World War II program, who's joined us to talk a little bit about the student perspective of what we do. We want to introduce you today to some of the ways in which the department is honoring and securing and extending the history of World War II uh, among the, the present generation of college students. And um, what we're doing to uh, immerse them in the history of the war and how we're trying to uh, provide experiences that are unique to this program uh, and unique therefore to their experience here at Ohio State University. We're coming out of a three year pause now from the pandemic and uh, the study abroad programs that the history department has had were really uh, running with strong momentum at the time the pandemic short circuited us. This was true of the program to Buenos Aires in Argentina. Uh, another program did Southern France and North Africa. But um, we wanna talk about the World War II study abroad program, which we instituted in 2012, 2013, when the university went from quarters to semesters. Uh, we see this as a, as a chance to provide a sort of widespread or broad explanation for what we've been doing and what we hope to continue to do. And as we go through, we'll explain what we have been doing with the students in the study abroad program. We'll also offer ways that you might um, enjoy participating in something like it yourselves. So um, let's, let's go on from there. I'm going to pass it first to Professor Mansour and let him take over for a bit. So thanks. So thanks, Dave. Um, I'm Pete Mansour. I uh, came to Ohio State after a 26 year career in the US Army that culminated with uh, two tours in Iraq, one as a brigade commander in Baghdad and the other as executive officer to General David Petraeus during the surge of US forces to Iraq in 2007 and 2008. And, and then I retired <laughs> rather abruptly, um, much to General Sh Petraeus's chagrin, but uh, Ohio State offered me uh, you know, an offer I couldn't refuse, the General Raymond E. Mason Jr. Chair of Military History. Uh, so every day I get to read, research, write, teach military history, which has been a passion of mine uh, since I was very young. Uh, I got my PhD from Ohio State back in 1995, uh, have published um, my first book, uh, was on World War II, the GI Offensive in Europe. Um, and since then, I've uh, published uh, more books on, on the Iraq War and some edited volumes, but World War II has always been my passion. And back in 2010, when a colleague, uh, Bill Childs, suggested that we establish a World War II study abroad program, I was all in. And he and I um, conducted a reconnaissance of the various sites in Europe. And then um, we established a, a program which went into effect in 2013. And then I was very happy to go along on the very first inaugural study abroad course in that year. And I'm still in touch with the students who, um, who made the journey. Uh, it was amazing how cohesive they became as a group. And to a person, they said that the, that study abroad was the most impactful thing they did while they were at Ohio State. Um, but it's more than just a trip. It begins with the study of World War II. Um, our course in World War II is the most subscribed history course uh, in our curriculum. Whatever size auditorium they give me, I can fill it up. Um, the maximum was Campbell Hall. I had a 225 seat auditorium and standing room only. Um, more normally, it's a 150 seat um, auditorium and it bounces around campus. Um, but you know, World War II is something that the students uh, are very, very interested in. Uh, many of their ancestors or forebears uh, living or deceased fought in the war or 
uh, at least were uh, present and, uh, and had stories from what wartime America was like and how united we were as a nation. Um, but what they don't know is what happened um, overseas and how the war was fought and the various controversies surrounding it. So it's become uh, a passion of mine to, to teach the course. And then every student who signs up for the study abroad program will have to take uh, history 3570, the history of World War II. Um, so what is it about World War II that makes it so uh, special? Well, for one, it was the costliest war in human history, uh, upwards of 72 million dead. And that number keeps getting revised upwards as we learn more about the deaths in China during the Second Sino-Japanese War that began in 1937. Um, large parts of Europe and Asia were devastated by the conflict. Uh, by the end of the war, America was feeding every nation on the planet uh, with the exception of China, um, at least to those that were involved in the war. A massive physical destruction, European cities um, devastated by, by air raids, uh, Japanese cities. Hunger and disease were rampant. And, um, and this caused really the, uh, the creation of a lot of United Nations agencies that were, are still with us today. Um, the United Nations itself was a new creation of World War II. Um, but the um, 12 million refugees and displaced persons in, in Europe alone uh, created, caused the creation of a UN agency on refugees. Uh, and UNICEF, for instance, is, is another outgrowth of uh, the war. So uh, this has uh, been, World War II was a earth shattering event in more ways than one, and it created uh, the system, uh, the global system that we know today, which is um, under, under change as we know. It shaped the world as well. It, um, it was the end of what I think historians in the future might call the two world wars, the great German war in Europe. The, basically the, where does Germany fit? The newly united Germany, which only became a nation in 1871, where does it fit in the scheme of European power? It wanted to be the superpower of the European continent. And instead, based on the two world wars, it became part of a shared European identity, uh, currently the European Union and NATO. Uh, world War II was the prelude to the competition between communism and capitalism that we know as the Cold War. It uh, sealed the fate of European empires throughout the world as they were seeing European nations were no longer had the power or the staying power to maintain control of their European, of their colonial possessions. It ushered in the atomic age and uh, it confirmed America's rise as the world's superpower um, and eventually became a bipolar system with the rise of the Soviet Union as well. Uh, but the United States gained a preeminent place in the world that it still um, holds today, although that again is under uh, some revision as, uh, as China grows in its capacity. Uh, unfortunately, World War II is a lesson in morality. The, world holoca the word Holocaust was created after the war to describe what Germany did to the Jews and other people that it murdered in industrial fashion. 13 million people uh, killed during the Holocaust. Uh, but that wasn't the end of, of the killing. Uh, the Japanese killed hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Chinese, some of them in biological and chemical warfare experiments. Um, you know, people were killed because of their race, their ethnicity, their religion. And the um, echoes of that are with us today in the killing fields of Cambodia and the slaughter in Rwanda um, and the more recent killing in Northern Iraq and Syria. Um, so this is part of what we teach when we teach World War II is, um, is the moral and ethical aspects of that and how that echoes down uh, today. 
uh, World War II was the only or the first war in history in which non-combatant deaths outnumbered combatant deaths. In other words, more civilians were killed in World War II than military uh, personnel. And why was that? Uh, so that's another thing that we teach and that we have the students wrestle with as they uh, consider the uh, need for and the costs of, say, strategic bombing or the dropping of the atomic bombs. World War II was also a massive catalyst for change. I mentioned um, the system of global international institutions that were created after the war. Um, World War II ended the Great Depression definitively, and uh, there was full employment in the United States for the first time in a long time. And because of uh, pent up savings um, after the war, there was not a return to depression as many people forecasted, but instead a great economic boom, which also created a great population boom, which we now know as the baby boom uh, generation. Um, new technologies caused by uh, the need to you know, secure victory, atomic weapons I mentioned, uh, that became atomic power, nuclear power after the war. Uh, rockets, the first rocket that left um, the Earth's atmosphere was the German V-2 rocket. And the first cruise missile was the German V-1 buzz bomb in the center there of the screen. A jet aircraft developed in World War II, radar, guided munitions. The first guided munition dropped in combat was in the Bay of Salerno. Um, no, I'm sorry, it was on the battleship Roma in the northern Mediterranean in uh, September 1943. So, um, you know, the idea that guided munitions first came into being in the uh, Gulf War, or even the Vietnam War is not true. They're actually an outgrowth of World War II. And then things you don't think about, computers um, and penicillin, antibiotics, all saw a uh, huge rate of growth um, and change during World War II. And finally, if I can get my screen to work. World War II um, it defined a generation, at least in the United States, what we now know as the greatest generation based on Tom Brokaw's uh, book of that title. Uh, these were uh, kids and young adults who grew up in the Great De Depression and uh, didn't ask to be put into uniform, but were drafted for the, by and large, and fought a war to liberate uh, mankind from the scourge of fascism. And the GIs as liberators is a theme that runs throughout uh, the course that I teach. Returning veterans then came home to an America that was uh, vastly changed, and they used their GI Bill benefits to get job training and education, and um, and they then became productive members of society. And World War II um, defined uh, this generation in, in some very profound ways. OK, I'm going to turn it back over to Dave for a, a moment to talk about why we go overseas to study this. The travel we do with students is really terrific. Uh, under any circumstances, uh, we go to uh, exciting, awesome places. But as uh, I think most students would tell you, and I think many of you have probably had the same experience, there's one thing to read about events in books. It's a whole other thing to have that reading and that knowledge reinforced when you visit a site. Uh, it might surprise some of you, it, maybe not, but we historians have to think very seriously about place, about sites, about the way the lay of the land, this is definitely true in military history, uh, altered and shaped the events themselves. Um, as often as, as not the, the particular place where something happened did a lot to define the history that we remember from it. And you don't quite appreciate that until you're, you're really there. So the, the first thing is that in, in spring, before we go to Europe, students take a couple of classes and they, they're, they're well versed in the general history of the places where they go. That allows them once they're there to really dig in and use their senses and their sights and their 
their uh, prior learning to really get things in place and understand the dynamics of the history that they've spent a, long, a, a lot of uh, time working on. So it, it adds to the, the general knowledge of anything in really incredible ways to be at the sites. Uh, there's no question in my mind, having done this now for a, a fair amount of time, that the study abroad experience is incredibly important to uh, students. This is particularly true of many of our students who have never been abroad before, and it, it, it's, it can be life-changing. I'll leave Kevin to talk a little bit about that and um, simply say that through most of our experience, the, the, the vast majority of students who've gone with us come back um, with a sense that they really had accomplished something through their travels, through their studies, and through the things they've seen. Now, just to give the obvious example of how being in a place really kind of reorders what you've learned about it. Well, the great example of that is Omaha Beach. For those of you who've been there, you'll, you'll appreciate the point. You can read about the, the frightening battle that ensued on that morning. When you're there though, especially if you're there at low tide, which is when you should be there to get the full effect, and you, you look out to 400 or 500 yards of open beach, open sand, you realize what those uh, American soldiers did when they landed there. They had to traverse that entire open area under withering German fire, most of them carrying at least 75 pounds on their back. It's an extraordinary and breathtaking, awesome thing to wrap your mind around. And it's really only when you're there, especially if the, if the weather is something like it was on that, uh, that June morning, that is sort of windy, sort of misty, uh, not exactly pleasant. You can really, really then wrap your mind around the, the experience and the courage that uh, was at hand that morning. But I wanna share a, uh, a somewhat more obscure perhaps uh, example with you. Pete, could you? flip for me. In 2019, which was our last pre-pandemic trip, uh, we, we stopped at um, the Tuileries Gardens in, in Paris. Now, when students uh, go on the trip, they're responsible for providing a kind of uh, uh, mini seminar, you might say, on their own research. And because we encourage them to do research on the things they're most interested in, and because the students who go with us are very often um, non-history majors, in fact, uh, roughly half of the uh, 163 students who've gone with us uh, were non-majors, we, we get a wide array of interests in various parts of the war experience. In this particular moment, um, Fiona Minnick and Matt Bonner uh, were interested in the art scene in occupied Paris. Fiona was interested in what sort of arts and artists continued their work uh, in the midst of the Nazi occupation. And Matthew was interested in the issue of art theft, the, the Monuments Men um, stuff, if, if you've seen that. Not very good movie, in my opinion. But anyhow, um, there it is. I knew that this was the place for them to talk to their colleagues. First of all, it's a very pleasant place. I suppose some of you have been there. Um, and it's, there's a lot of room there. They have those uh, chairs that are open for anybody. And it was easy for us to make a, a nice semicircle. But the real reason we were there was that just to the left of that scene was the, is, is the jeu de pomme, which is, uh, it was actually built in the late 19th century as a tennis court, an indoor tennis court. Um, eventually the Louvre took it over and used it as a kind of uh, spillover warehouse and also I think they did some retouching um, there. But that's where the Nazis stored their stolen Paris art, the Rothschilds um, work and, and so forth. And it was there that uh, Rose Vallon, famously uh, a member of the French resistance, not only did scribe work for the Nazis, but she recorded almost all of the art that came into the building and snuck that information out so when the war was over, uh, a good deal of it could be found. She was the real hero of the, of the whole issue of uh, stolen art and the repatriation, such as it was, 
that they were able to, to uh, manage. And so I knew that that was a perfect place for those two to talk, uh, and it was. But even I didn't appreciate where we were until we were standing there. I was standing behind them. I always sneak around and take pictures um, so that we have pictures of everybody lecturing. And it was not until I was behind them that it dawned on me that we were directly across the street from the Hotel La Maurice, which was the headquarters of uh, General von Choltitz and the, the uh, German occupational authority. And it amazed me. I learned something really important there. Rose Vallon is a hero in France, uh, deservedly so, but it never occurred to me that she was not only sneaking material out from under the noses of her bosses in that building, but that she was right across the street from not Gestapo headquarters, but the uh, occupational government headquarters. They could almost look into her window and see what she was doing in there if they bothered to look. Uh, to me, it just uh, reinforced what a remarkable woman she was and uh, really added something to my understanding of that particular element in this particular part of World War II history. And of course, it was great to be able to take Fiona and Matthew around the side of the building uh, where uh, Rose Vallon has a, a marker to her name and to her, her achievements. There's nothing like this. And I might say that not only do I think that this adds immeasurably to student learning, but this is an obvious case in which it add, added immeasurably to professorial learning as well. Um, uh, that's good, Pete, can we go on? Yeah, <clears throat> so um, I wanted to mention <clears throat> that 2013 was the first European study abroad, but we actually, that was not the first World War II study abroad. The first World War II study abroad was in 2012, and it was really a target of opportunity for us. It was a one-time um, trip because we teamed up with the Greatest Generations Foundation, which is a non-governmental organization that raised money to take veterans back to their battlefields uh, in World War, World War II battlefields. And so they took this group of veterans back to uh, Pacific War battlefields in this case. And what we did is we paired students up with veterans of the World War II in the Pacific. Uh, and there were Army veterans, Army Air Corps, Marine and Navy veterans. And we had eight students and, um, and we traveled to the Pacific War battlefields of Guam, Saipan, Tinian, and Iwo Jima. Uh, you can see here, we're planting the Ohio State flag on the black sands, the black volcanic sands of Iwo Jima with Mount Suribachi in the background. Um, it was an enormously successful trip. Um, I wish we, you know, the veterans were, with us and, and would be with us longer because uh, if we could do this again, it would be worth it. Um, the veterans related their experiences to the students who were tasked with writing them down and blogging about them. Uh, but it was really, it was like grandfathers telling their grandkids about what they did in the big one. Uh, in many cases for the first time that they've opened up uh, about with these stories. Uh, and I wanna talk about the student on the left of your screen there. Uh, that's Mike Tabor, a Marine veteran, student veteran, uh, but he fought in the Battle of Fallujah in 2004. Uh, to his right is uh, Iron Mike Mervosh, a Marine sergeant who fought in the Battle of uh, Saipan and Iwo Jima. And they're standing on top of Mount Suribachi. And you want to talk about a connection to have two Marines in two different generations talking about their battlefield experiences um, was just really, really powerful. Uh, now, Mike was scheduled to come back. This was during spring break. And he was scheduled to come back and go to Florida with his girlfriend. And he called her up and he said, change of plans, honey, we're going to San Diego. And they linked up with, uh, with Iron Mike there in Camp Pendleton and spent the spring break with, uh, with him there. Uh, so it was um, really incredible. And you could see the testimonial on your screen <clears throat> from Danielle Gagliardi, who uh, went on to uh, graduate from the St. Louis School of Law and is now a lawyer here in Columbus. Um, 
but it was um, an incredible, incredible journey. Dave, over to you. We've been extraordinarily lucky and privileged, in my opinion, to have the kinds of students join us who have indeed done so. Uh, we've, we've had a remarkable group. Uh, it really testified to the quality of the program and to the momentum we had. But, you know, um, we really owe so much to uh, just how talented they were. This, this is Kevin's group here. Uh, you can see they're under the Jesse Owens Ali sign. That's alongside the Olympic Stadium in Berlin, sort of our last stop. Uh, and that's a, uh, that's a really terrific group of students right there. Uh, you see Kevin over on your right. Uh, to his left uh, is Ty Webb, who uh, Pete had mentioned that he stays in touch with students. Well, Ty was just here today. He's now an army doctor stationed in Texas and uh, decided to stop in and see if we were around to revisit with us uh, while he and his wife were back on his very first leave. Uh, go ahead, Pete. I want to show you just the itinerary that we go through uh, with the students. First of all, we start in London. Uh, that's Jerry Delafarno, uh, now with the Air Force, speaking about uh, fighter command in front of the Imperial uh, War Museum in London on the South Bank. Uh, slide. Of course, we go to Normandy uh, from London where we stop at all of the beaches. Uh, and of course we go to the iconic American cemetery. There are 12 Buckeyes uh, alum and students interned at the Colville Sumer Cemetery. And uh, we're very careful and, and honored to leave a, a bit of Buckeye remembrance with them every year we go. You can see Drew Schroeder there planting the Buckeye flag at uh, one of the markers. Uh, talented students, Drew is finishing Harvard Law this year uh, and I remain in touch with him. Next, uh, I think next we have Omaha Beach. Uh, we do the cemetery and the beach on the same day, uh, sort of in between Utah and the uh, British Canadian beaches. I was mentioning about how, how broad the beach is at low tide. And if you've never seen it, there's a decent picture of it. Uh, you can see how far out it goes. Um, and again, that is probably low tide. Next, from Normandy, we go to Paris for a couple of days. It seems, it seems odd to go to France with students and not stop in Paris to me, so we do. Uh, and as I showed you a little bit earlier, there are lots of World War II uh, sites, small and modest, and you got to look for them perhaps, but they are, they're littered through the city. Uh, you can see the tower in the background there as the group comes out of the Les Invalides uh, Military Museum. From here, we go to Krakow, Poland. And while we go to the Schindler Museum from the Schindler List's movie, the, the factory is a museum now, a really nicely done one. We're really there to go out to Auschwitz. Uh, what does the power of place do to learning? Sometimes it just takes your breath away. That railroad tie right there, that spike, probably saw over a million people go over it on their way to their deaths in the gas chambers, which are about 100, 150 yards to the left of it. There's another one, Pete. It's always a sobering day, one that takes your breath away and um, leaves you at a loss for words. And I found that no matter how often I go, I, I have the same reaction. Um, the students there look pretty sober and dumbfounded as they look at um, the memorial that sits on top of where one of the gas chambers was. From there, we go to Berlin. And there's lots to do in Berlin uh, regarding the war as, um, as much as that, that city was flattened, uh, there's still a lot of sites to see, including the site where um, uh, Colonel von Stauffenberg was executed the night of July 20th, 1944, after the failed attempt to assassinate uh, Hitler in East Prussia. Uh, that's the very spot where they put him against the wall and executed him and then his fellow um, conspirators. Uh, we end with that stop at Jesse Owens Ali, one more, Pete. 
uh, and it's always a, a, a good stop. Uh, you can see a kind of giddiness on the student's face as we pose underneath uh, the street sign. Um, what's going through their mind right now? Um, we don't have to listen to Steigerwald's harangues <laughs> anymore. And that's enough to put a smile on everybody's face. Um, they know that they've done a really terrific amount of work, that they've done some terrific traveling. It's exhilarating as it is exhausting. And they know they've come out on the other side, um, the better for it. That's a really uh, extraordinary group of people there of that group of 24, 16 were honor students. 10 of them were presidents of, of uh, student organizations here on campus. Kevin, I'm gonna throw it over to you now and let you have your say for a few minutes, okay? Absolutely. Um, it's a pleasure to absolutely speak to these students. Um, so, uh, hello everyone. This is Professor Stargwaldum, um had already mentioned. I uh, was a 2017 alum of this uh, World War II trip, and I graduated from Ohio State back in 2019. Um, and so, like many alums will attest to, we still will get um, the occasional email from the Department of Arts and Sciences. Um, and I had seen one in my um, school email recently uh, uh, regarding this trip, and I really just. I had to jump at the opportunity to um, get into touch with uh, Dr. Stargold again to just get an opportunity to speak because I really am um, a student who can firsthand attest to just how impactful uh, this trip was for me and was for most of my um, colleagues who went with me. Um, so I, I wanted to just background, I think it's important to mention too that I am also, uh, I was a non-major, uh, uh, by that I mean I was a non-history major. Um, I originally came to Ohio State thinking I was going to teach high school social studies and um, actually ended up graduating with a, a bachelor's in political science. And at the time when I was going on this trip, I actually was a political science major. And so um, I uh, was fortunate enough to have already have taken a little bit of history credits, but it was um, very manageable to do so as a non-major as well to in order to take this prerequisite credit and i would like to uh if anyone has any questions about that later i'd, I'd love to speak on it but um i just i i i i want to say that at my four years at ohio state when i was there i i was involved in a lot i did quite a bit i wanted to get the full college experience and it's it's unquestionable that today as a 26 year old out of college that when i look back on it um, there truly was nothing that was more profoundly impactful on me uh, than this trip. And here's why. This trip really will humble you. It, it will really mature you. I don't think that there was really anything um, up to my life at that point, being a 20-year-old, 21-year-old when I went on this trip, that really had that sort of effect on me as much as it did standing in the American Cemetery um, at Normandy Beach or walking the same uh, pathway that many of the Jewish prisoners walked as they got off the trains. I mean, I, I can tell you today, if I, if I close my eyes right now, I can tell you exactly what the weather was like. I can tell you exactly what the scene was. I can tell you what everyone was wearing as we were walking. I will carry it with me, uh, honestly, probably for the rest of my life. Um, I can tell you guys that I think that it's it's just beyond important as young students. Many of you will probably go on to be, you know, academics in history of some, uh, of some sort or lawyers or doctors, what have you, teachers. It's so important for us to have experiences like this that really force you to rethink how you process the world. I mean, to me, it, it, it made me rethink and, and reappreciate life. It made me rethink and, and reevaluate um, you know, how I really approach the, the, fr the fragility of life. I mean, it's, it's, you go to a place like Auschwitz and you look at, um, you know, the shoes and the, the teeth, the hair that were left behind by these prisoners. And, you know, I'm somebody who spent my entire life, you know, my exposure to World War II was watching Saving Private Ryan and Band of Brothers. And it, it's just as Professor Stargold said, it's really hard for someone to, grasp the true impact of, of these events and what happened by just watching movies or reading books. It's not until you're actually there standing on the beach and you can see firsthand the amount of, you know, white cross headstones, the amount of um, 
you know, just the, the amount of the pictures of everyone who went through Auschwitz concentration camp. They, and I'm, again, I'm going to allude to the teeth and the hair. That to me is something I'll keep with me forever. But this, these type of experiences, whether you like it or not, make force you to grow up. And people, and I can attest to firsthand, I'm, I'm, I'm in my third year of law school here, about to be an attorney, um, fingers crossed here in about eight months. I can't tell you, you know, every single job interview I've had, every single um, interview I've had with an academic uh, at, at law school, I just had my uh, my my um, uh, my interview with the Ohio Bar Association to be an attorney, something you have to do, you have to meet with two uh, members of the Ohio Supreme Court. We talked about this trip. I kid you not. It was on my resume. And we, we had a 35 minute conversation with the guy about uh, his father was a um, airborne veteran, 82nd Airborne. And, you know, it's you guys by by undergoing an experience like this, it will open more doors for you than you even realize. And, and it, because people are so attracted to um not only these type of life changing experiences, but people who are able to articulate how this has impacted you. You know, it, it shows a sign of maturity that it is really um, becomes obvious to people who, uh, you know, have never had these sort of experiences. It's really admirable. Um, and so, you know, I can't stress that enough of how much I, I hope that I wish that every single person who got to go through Ohio State could have this or could go on this trip. And I know it's not possible, but I cannot recommend enough how much I think you guys should fight tooth and nail to go on something like this. Um, and I also just wanted to speak quickly about, you know, uh, I personally used the step funding when I was a sophomore um, to, to, to pay for this trip. I was very fortunate to get the full amount. Um, and I also, I worked a lot in college and so I had some savings, but the money is out there too. There are so many organizations and, and alumni associations and et cetera that offer scholarships and money for those who are looking for it. And um, I implore you guys to, if you're interested in that trip, you know, take advantage of that. You just have to ask, but make sure that you do ask because there are so many people out there that are looking to, to give students these sort of opportunities and the opportunities are out there for you to take. Um, and, you know, lastly, I think just to sum it up, I if there's anything that has been more um, important to me than coming out of this this trip is just you know um, the what I would call the friendship that I've really built with Professor Steigerwald. I mean, it's you have some absolute experts in their field here in, in history, and you guys should take full advantage of you know making the effort to befriend these professors and get to know these extraordinary people and these just amazing individuals. I mean, you, you, you talk about, you know, you only have four years at Ohio State, but some of these decisions will impact you for the rest of your life. And it's certainly I can say, you know, my one, my, uh, I'll just share with you briefly my story of meeting Dr. Stargerwald. I uh, took his class freshman year um, and I got destroyed on one of my first essays I wrote for him. He gave me a C minus and I went in to talk to him. Um, just on the off chance that he would be there on an, on an office hours day. And he ended up, I waited there for 45 minutes before he came and he finally showed up. And um, it has profoundly affected my life to the point where, you know, we're still in touch to this day. And I, I just take advantage of these opportunities while you can, everyone. I think that it, you, it, you will keep these memories with you for the rest of your life. Thanks, Kevin. I Thank hope you. that the students who are here will take your advice and we really appreciate you showing up. Um, Kevin mentioned scholarships and um, we are fortunate enough to be the only study abroad program at the university that has its own endowment. We've been working hard to raise money for the students who go on the program. And so far, all of the students who have gone with us have gotten some level of funding. Uh, students whose families who can demonstrate a particular need, we've been able to provide a little bit more than the, the general funding. Uh, and we're very proud of what we've been able to do, what we put together and what we are able to do for all of the students who, who uh, come into the program. Um, and at this point, we're going to pitch over to uh, Professor Mansour and we're gonna talk a little bit about how you can be a part of the program and how you can help. Uh, so Kevin <clears throat> recommended that everyone travel overseas. Most of you actually are post uh, graduation. 
And can you experience this World War II history? And the answer is yes, you can. Um, uh, I uh, helped to conceive what we call Friends of History tours that we've been taking since 2011. Um, the first tour was to London, Normandy, and Paris, and then we added Berlin as a stop. And we've been changing it up every now and then, Bastogne and Krakow in 2015, and uh, London, Normandy, Amsterdam in 2018. And then one off, one year we went to Italy and looked at the World War II sites there. Um, so these are history tours that we contract with a uh, tour agency to, to do the logistics. Uh, but then uh, Dr. Steigerwald and Dr. Peter Hahn, who's a diplomatic historian, and I travel along with the tour group uh, to give you on-site uh, lectures and experience. And it's really a fabulous, fabulous trip. Um, we also bake in a $1,000 tax deductible contribution uh, to the scholarship program, the World War II Study Abroad Scholarship Program, as part of the tour fee. So the tour is perhaps a little bit more expensive than some other Normandy tours, but not overly so. Uh, but you're helping build up that scholarship endowment for future generations of students. Um, the next tour is next June, 17th through the 30th. Uh, we're going to London, Normandy, Paris, Krakow, and Berlin, the, the full meal deal, uh, two weeks overseas. And you can see the website here, uh, history.osu.edu backslash alumni, backslash alumni, slash tour, dash tours. And I'm going to bring it up. And you can see here, um, so here is the, uh, the site. You can download a reservation form or the tour brochure uh, from this site. Um, it begins actually- Professor Mansour, sorry to interrupt, but we're still just seeing the slide. Oh, okay. Let me, thanks for that. You bet. Let me work on this and uh, voila, can you, you can see it now, right? Yep, all set. All right, so you can download the reservation form or the tour brochure there. Uh, this is the Churchill Hotel in, uh, in Bayou. Uh, there's a pre-tour excursion, <clears throat> which is an additional cost to Bletchley Park, uh, but the itinerary begins on June 17th with um, three days in London. Uh, the Churchill's War Rooms. We actually have dinner in Churchill's War Rooms uh, catered uh, just for our group. Uh, then we go to the Imperial War Museum the next day, um, take the uh, ferry over the channel to Caen and from there by bus to Bayou. Uh, and then over the next few days, we see Pegasus Bridge, uh, Aramanche, where the ruins of the uh, Mulberry Harbor are located. Uh, the Bayou Tapestry is an optional stop for you. We see the Commonwealth Military Cemetery. Um, the next day we go to um, Utah Beach. We see the uh, Easy Company Battle of uh, Band of Brothers Monument. And um, there is a church at Angleville Plain with uh, two combat medics uh, where they saved lives of both Germans and Americans on D-Day as they parachuted in with the 101st Airborne. One of them uh, is a, an Ohio State alum and his ashes, a uh, part of them are buried there in that cemetery. Uh, we also see St. Mariglis, the German War Cemetery. Um, we, the next day we go to Point du Hoc and Omaha Beach, the Normandy American Military Cemetery. Uh, from there, we travel to Paris, uh, a couple of days there, including a stop at the, the Army Museum, Les Invalides. And then we fly to, from there to Krakow. We see Schindler's factory, as Dave mentioned, and Auschwitz. And from there, we bus to Berlin, where we do a wartime walk. And uh, we see the Vance House, um, where if you've ever seen the HBO movie Conspiracy, which you should, it's awesome. Uh, that was where the final solution was decided at the Vance House, now a museum 
to the Holocaust, and it's really terrific. And we stop at the Cecilia Hoff Palace, where the Potsdam Conference took place, and we end up the same place the students end up, at the Olympic Stadium, where Jesse Owens won four gold medals in the 1936 Olympics. Um, it's $5,990 per person, uh, double occupancy, and the single supplement is, uh, if you're going alone, $7,290. And for that, like I said, you get two weeks in Europe, um, all your breakfast, three dinners, and a, and a lunch provided. Um, the rest of the meals are on you. And of course, you're going to have to purchase your own airline ticket to and from. But uh, I highly recommend if you want to experience World War II in a way that few people have, um, consider going on this tour if your means um, allow it. And I will stop there and uh, we can take questions. I have about 10 minutes left if uh, anyone wants uh, to type in a question. or a question about the, the tour. Um, the tour is capped at 26 participants. Um, so there's there's still space left. We've been advertising this since August, um, but we will, we cap it at 26 just uh, because, um, you know, you get too many people at some of these sites and, um, and it's just not as special of a of a experience. So uh, that'll be the cap. Recommended so reading. Um, I like A War to Be Won by Alan Millette and Williamson Murray. They were my PhD advisors here at um, Ohio State. Rick Atkinson's The Guns at Last Light is also a, a very excellent book. Uh, Stephen Ambrose's D-Day, um, still good reading. Uh, Dave, you want to talk about required classes? Uh, I saw a, a question about whether we're offering this trip every year or every other year. Um, and, I'm the not required, and the required classes you have to take. So the answer is yes, we offer this program every year that COVID doesn't kill it. Um, and next year, in 2023, we're offering a one-time version of the tour for student veterans and ROTC students. So we're actually going to have two groups go overseas next May. One will be sort of the normal uh, student study abroad, uh, which any student can apply for. And then another will be student ve veterans uh, who have uh, served in the military or in the ROTC program. Uh, as far as the required courses for the program, you want to address that, Dave? Well, for the students, uh, there are two. Uh, Pete's general lecture class on uh, the military history of World War II. That's History 3570. And then a seminar with me or with Pete, depending on whether the, um, with me or, or the vets, student vets. And that's History 3670. With me, the curriculum is tied to the itinerary. So we, we look at uh, the war in London. We talk about the Blitz, among other things. One of the things we want to do with students is help them see the different national perspectives on the war. You get a different uh, kind of take on things every place you're at. The English thought the, the war was the people's war. Uh, the war created a kind of national unity that transcended those rigid class uh, barriers that are always uh, inlaid in, in British society. Uh, the French are still pretty much convinced that everybody was a resistant, uh, except a, a few who uh, collaborated. And so they're, they're anxious to talk about the resistance and not so anxious to talk about the Vichy collaboration government. Uh, the Poles are convinced that um, they had it the worst of all, and in terms of per capita deaths, they, they were right. Um, and the, the, the Germans obviously have their own particular view of things now, uh, which surprises a lot of students and how open they are about it. But um, that's the stuff we look at with me in seminar. The travel class itself is also a three hour 
history class. Uh, Dave, there's a question <clears throat> whether students that have a personal interest such as OSS history have an opportunity to do a deep dive uh, into that either in the course in the spring or overseas? Uh, yeah, actually, I mean, I think we're open enough to any interest um, that we can we can guide students in their own particular ways. That's what I try to do in, in seminar. And of course, then again, when we're traveling, we can um, we can work on that as well. I don't see that as a, any sort of problem at all. It's kind of the, the point of what, what I want students to do with their own work. Okay, anyone else? Typing in one more, one more reading suggestion. <laughs> oh no, the alums, no, 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 no. You, um, we'd love <laughs> to have you in class, but <laughs> No, we just we would encourage some reading beforehand, um, but uh, 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 no, of course not. We we wouldn't we don't expect that at all. For the alums, uh, we'll give you a reading list. Um, I was reminded uh, by uh, my fellow professor, twenty twenty three may be our last Friends of History tour group. We'd like to do it every year if we could, um, but. Uh, we've sort of cycled through all of the uh, history alumni that we know. Um, and, you know, we have to have an audience to offer the program every year. So I guess it depends if the Alumni Association wants to hire us on as, uh, as Alumni Association uh, tour guides. But uh, right now, this is offered through the Department of History. And uh, 2023 may be the last one. I can't guarantee it. But um, so. There it is. I see I should give a, a shout out to Megan Van Olmsick, uh, who's joined us. Um, and and I, I'm going to chide you, Megan, for not uh, sending me an email update. So you owe me that, OK? <laughs> That's terrific. I look forward to it. We also did have one question about uh, can alums audit the classes if they're available to do that at all? Oops, I, I typed in the answer, but for the wrong person. Uh, program, if you're in program 60, you can uh, sign up for um, HI 3570 History of World War II. There we go. Got it in the right place now. Um, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, you You actually don't even have to be uh, an alumnus to sign up for the Friends of History tour. You just need to be a friend of the history department, which you are by definition when you sign up for the tour. Um, so yeah, I brought uh, a lot of my friends and family along uh, and they've really, really enjoyed the experience overseas. And you know, everyone gives uh, the same contribution to the program <clears throat> by signing up. So everyone becomes a friend's, friend of history by definition. And uh, we've got about four minutes left if anyone has a final question. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Okay, well, we'll stick around for the remaining four minutes if uh, anyone wants uh, to um, put a further question in the chat. Otherwise, thanks for uh, being an attentive audience, a captive audience tonight. Thank you, everybody. We really appreciate it. We know time's special. And uh, we appreciate you spending a little bit of it with us. And just as a reminder, this has been recorded. So please check the history department's website at history.osu.edu in a week or so. Uh, and hopefully we'll have that up before too much longer to have this available for your review in the future if you have any questions. Thank you all so much for attending tonight.